session of day one at the Creative Freedom Summit. I am here to welcome Pablo, uh, CEO of PenPot, to the stage to share with us about the public roadmap and the secret agenda. Um, <laughs> uh, Maureen and myself are here and we will come back on at the end of your talk to moderate any questions from the chat and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Marie. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to the organization for inviting me. I, I really wanted to participate and have the chance to share uh, some context on what we're building and um, what is public and perhaps what's not so public, but equally or even more important than the, than the roadmap itself. Well, I'm Pablo. Uh, you can see, probably you can barely read it, but uh, there are some pointers to, um, you know, major social um, just links there, my, my handle and my personal uh, website. So this, you know, that's, that's the only thing. So a bit of context, um, since I would really like to have this talk as a self-contained talk, I think it's important for everyone to be on the same page, like what is PEMPOD, why we built it, and then move on to the, to the roadmap and the, the agenda, the underlying agenda. So for those of you who don't know PEMPOD, PEMPOD is an online design and prototyping tool that is, that is uh, open standards uh, based and uh, it's open source. Uh, it uses the uh, Mozilla public license um, and it's meant for cross-functional teams. So that means both designers and developers to be able to uh, just design and prototype um, user interfaces for the most part, although it's, in a way, it's multi-purpose, but it's 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 big uh, bonus uh, comes when you're designing interfaces for software applications or devices, some, something like that. So here is a screenshot where you can see that in action. Um, you can see, you know, the, the user elements in a design and prototyping tool. And uh, of course, I forgot to mention that it's browser-based, so you only need a browser. Um, here you can see the interactive uh, prototyping features where you can um, link. Uh, you know, different actions or triggers to different parts of the prototype. So you can sort of mimic, um, have a mock-up of uh, the user experience and make decisions or have conversation uh, around that. And um, also, um, since we are open standards uh, based, everything you can take both the visual assets, but also the SVG that comes with it when, when there is SVG, which is almost all the time and also HTML and CSS. So to the right pane, you can see uh, code snippets, but again, barely readable. Um, I can share the PDF uh, later if you want to, to look at it, but basically everything on PenPod is uh, both design and code at the same time. And then it's important to have feedback loop um, as a built-in. Like if you're going to have this collaborative approach to design and prototyping, you do have to have a comment system and you know various threat um, common thread systems uh, in place and also uh, perhaps it's a bit more boring and not that less exciting but you have to have uh, team management project management uh, differentiating between what's a library of assets uh, a draft uh, project a, a, a full-fledged project but also of course um, have a, a way to contribute for those type of assets as content and libraries. We have a section, public change of it, and a selection, a curated selection of those are available in app. So you can like one click import a UI toolkit and start working uh, using that. So this is what is PenPod. Now, why we build PenPod, um, we have to go a big back in time to the company that built PenPod, which is uh, Kaleidos and Kaleidos uh, you, you, you would have to uh, picture it. We, we founded the company back in 2011 uh, in Spain. And uh, the company basically was uh, a, a perfect blend between um, open source hackers and open source designers. And we, we wanted to have this um, diversity within the software development um, ecosystem where we would have equal standing as coders or designers, you know, engineers and creative people. And there is a nice um, picture that represents that uh, top right, where uh, you, you can see Esther and also Maria to the to the right, and you can see like design and code working together. In that case, uh, they were 
just enjoying uh, one of our week-long hackathons, our Pi Weeks, uh, personal innovation weeks, where the whole company um, was and still to this day is challenged to learn new things and, and have fun uh, either alone or within teams. So, you know, we have that in July and in December, and it's just great for creation and, and innovation. And there you can see uh, both design and code working together. That, I think that was a game with some dragons or something like that. Now, what we felt was wrong uh, within our company was that the lean and agile processes were only welcoming and benefiting developers, not designers. So everything about Scrum and Kanban and the Lean principles and Agile techniques were mostly defined and enjoyed by developers. And designers had to just reluctantly adapt to that, to those processes. So we decided to uh, create a platform, an Agile platform called Taiga. And you can see some of the, uh, some screenshots there um, below. So T-A-I-G-A. That will be the first open source, well, the first agile platform, regardless of its open source nature, that would really welcome designers. That that was uh, back in 2015. Now, uh, it was uh, an immediate success within the company because we saw designers really engaging. The thing here was that we were able to achieve much um, closer interaction and flow between design and code just by having a um, project management tool that was giving equal importance to uh, design and code. And some of you might know about Taiga, and it was an, you know, a, a great uh, product. It's still a great product. And we are actually um, building the next major iteration, what we call it uh, Taiga Next, which is going to be uh, awesome. And it's going to be part of the hidden agenda. So um, uh, you know, uh, stick, stick with me. Um, now. The thing that happened with that is that it was so successful. Sometimes this happens. You can, you know, some things can go too successful. That designers hit a hit a hit a wall in the sense that their productivity with the tools that they were they, they had at hand, uh, designers, were not up to the level of workflow um, virtuosity that we were enjoying as teams. And there was no online design and prototyping tool um, good enough for them um, in open source. It was nothing like that, actually. So they asked to break a sacred rule at Kaleidos and, and use proprietary software for the first time. And, um, and they, 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 they asked for, to use uh, Figma to say just uh, we need to have some way of real time collaborating, having this uh, UX, this prototyping, interactive program just to to be as fast as developers and to be as productive and feel joy and, and, and you know, about a, about, a, about a work. So it's great that we have the lean process already, but then our daily work, our, our daily productivity, it's, um, is an issue. So we have Pi Weeks. So what, guess what? That we said, okay, let's, let's do that as a temporary solution. But then um, Juan here pictured and Andre, uh, decided to take the next five week and say, okay, let's build the open source Figma killer and just go beyond that. So you can see here a very early prototype. Actually, that's that's a, a functional prototype. It looks super dated, I know, but um, but it was the seed to what is uh, what Pempot is is now. So the whole company conspired to at the same time that we would use temporary use uh, a tool like Figma, we would just build um, just the replace the natural replacement and in doing so we would also bring i think much joy to the whole open source ecosystem <clears throat> now how do you execute this you made that decision you go all in with this and you uh say okay but kaleidos as a company is um agency is a boutique consultancy company that will work for other companies or the startups to build their technology for a fee and even though we have these side projects like Taiga and Pempot, this might not be, um, there might not be enough bandwidth. We might go super slow. That is, uh, that is a big issue. For a tool like Pempot to be built, you re it's very challenging. You, need, you really need to have a full team devoted for a short amount of time so that you can intensify that, that uh, development cycle. 
anyway, we decided uh, by the end of 2019 to migrate the company from a consultancy status to an open source product status. Then we got um, hit by COVID, but we, we, we decided that that decision would remain uh, despite the risks. And we just got our savings together, uh, pulled some seed money and some helps for angels and family and friends and all that. And we kickstarted the new adventure. Some of you might have been uh, present at FOSDEM 2020, so just weeks away from lockdown and where we actually presented this. So, yeah. um, so the roadmap was easy enough for the first stage. Like we will have to uh, so, sort out the specific challenges for a tool like Pempo. Like we have both technical and UX UI challenges. Um, we would have to make sure that we have a, an open, uh, very you know, engaged community. Like honestly, bring community into the, the decision making process and contributions and everything. We would like to. We, we would need to have a, the best onboarding experience for designers. For designers, I will I think touch upon this strategic decision later on but suffice to say this this was um this was a great decision to make early on instead of targeting uh developers and then of course even though we wanted to go beyond figma um that that's the biggest incumbent that's the incumbent we we needed to um for some time have an overlap with the the features that make uh, that tool um, appealing to uh, to the designers um, worldwide. But then, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, you know, <clears throat> towards relevance, because we want to be relevant. I mean, I think it's um, relevance in terms of uh, footprint, in terms of mindshare, in terms of being a sustainable business. We want really to do this to to have a really um, tangible, positive net impact, you know, net positive impact on society through technology, so through open source. But there are some question marks there. So yeah, I, so I say, so part of the process was um, the FOSDEM 2020, at the time it was called UXbox, then we had the rename process done. So it was no longer UXbox, it was Pempot. Uh, Clara here also, there's a, a talk on FOSDEM 20. To, yeah, 2022 about uh, how we um, process feedback and of course uh, forget about the uh, the dated uh, shot uh, you know the, the product actually evolved quite um, fast and then we got some ideas on what the the future roadmap would look like um, so we would like to have a plugin architecture so uh, people could integrate and extend pinball uh, to shoot their specific workflows who doesn't feel unique, you know, and special, and want to, you know, uh, hack into the products and the tools and and use them the way they want, um, and then invest now into specific design and developers interaction and that collaboration. Um, how does it look like? It was very important for us to think about. Okay, now we have to think about features. I'm saying this because we have achieved. You know, by the end of this month, we are releasing a sort of official launch for Pempo, like GA, and we feel comfortable saying that we have achieved this uh, feature parity. Okay, it's where it matters. I mean, it's impossible to have everything that um, a tool like Figma has, but where it matters, we feel pretty comfortable that we that we have achieved that. But then, then you have this other milestones along the road. Um, also, um, um, an easier you know content space where it's easier to to contribute and 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 share content. And then also build Tiger's integration <clears throat> so that both products make this workflow between scope definition and project management and the design process seamless. I think this, that's a big opportunity for us to, um, to have a, you know, two out of the four tools that all digital teams use, uh, you know, project management, design tool, code, uh, code management and chat, you know, two out of four to be very very close knit very 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 well integrated even though they might be have their own personality and agency but have a nice uh, integration and then uh, <clears throat> yeah something happened um and in, in, back in september uh, we privately called that figma gate that some of you will um will uh, recognize that by adobe acquires figma term 
and we um, you know, at Adobe acquired Figma with, uh, you know, uh, they, they spent $20 billion. Um, it was huge in terms of the size of that deal, unexpectedly big for the time. And, but also it was huge in terms of the emotional distress that this caused to designers worldwide. Not so much for developers that probably would say that they were you know, already expecting some, some of it, but designers were... Um, had this issue. I, you know, when I was would be discussing this with journalists, I would tell them like, look, this is the the, the close the, uh, close metaphor to this is like Emperor Palpatine had just hired Princess Leia. Uh, like this this Figma company was um, sort of the rebels, and they just decided to um, to be acquired. So it, it it felt wrong. So you can see there's there's charts in terms of adoption, exposure, and all that. And what did that change in terms of our public roadmap? What, you know, what are the changes? <clears throat> Nothing, <clears throat> excuse me, nothing changed. It was great to see that adoption. It was great to see designers enjoying that onboarding experience. Like it felt polished, it felt for them. Uh, they didn't see this as an open source tool that was like imposed to them, uh, but that was not counting on them. So, there was no need for us to change uh, the roadmap at all. Uh, it was it was really it was really good to see that because uh, when you have this um, intense exposure, you might find that there was some some killer features that you haven't even planned that are people you know that people really need. Whatever people would tell us they wanted, they were already in development process. Anyway, we have surveys. We we already had that. There's nothing changed, so that was great. The only thing that really changed was uh, from like January to May, and then after Adobe uh, Figma, in our onboarding surveys, the relative um, contribution of people coming from Figma doubled. You can see that there, right? So um, less people, you know, fewer people saying I haven't used any tool. Um, and then, uh, on the contrary, like a lot of people saying, "Yeah, I'm using Figma." So, so less people not having exposed to a design tool uh, equal uh, because the rest uh, you can see, yeah, between none and other, we had like 50%, and that um, dramatically decreased to uh, just 25%, and that was taken over by by Figma. So that yeah, that changed, but it was a change in demographics, not in terms of any impact on the roadmap. I hope you're following me here. So, speaking of roadmap, is the roadmap public? It is. It uh, has always been. We don't really are super fans of GitHub as a place, GitHub or GitLab as a place to do, you know, to show your roadmap. So, we use Taiga. So, you can go to, uh, yeah, to our Pempot project on Taiga and you can see the backlog and it is prioritized, sort of prioritized. It's, it's, a, it's a nice shape. And then you can also sneak peek into the current sprint. Actually, if you go now, <laughs> you can see what is keeping the team busy prior to the GA launch. You can see all the details. It's everything is transparent. You can see, you know, where people are struggling, you know, all the comments, everything. <clears throat> There's a lot of tension right now because we have a fixed date and we want to honor that. Commitment, uh, so you, you can go see. So it's not only like the roadmap, but also the sprint. So what's going on, whether it's the, in the design process or already in development. And of course, the, the issues. But if you go and, and read all that, what you see is that there are some big themes um, that cover that public roadmap. So I'm not going to uh, comment on all of them, but you would see like advanced components or everything in design should be a variable that you can tweak and then like a macro just um, have ripple effects on the whole design or have... Um, Use code first layout systems like Flex Layout, which is coming in a, in a couple of weeks, instead of just a design centric layout that needs to be interpreted by a developer. So then we will have grid layout and whatever slash you know uh, layout system or variable phone support or code um, code inspection options or web hooks or plugin architecture or something very dear to us, which is performance. Uh, we are using uh, SVG rendering. <clears throat> And we use in the browser, and uh, performance is always an issue. It will always be an issue for a tool like this. 
but in particular we have an advantage here that if we go we can tap into um, the higher limit that the browser gives you if you're using uh, the DOM rendering portion uh, which gives you 16 gigabytes of memory for you for the process for a tab um, contrary to what Figma and others are using which is the WebAssembly memory limit which is like very very, very um, in a, in a bad, bad way, I can say like the runtime memory you're using for both the, the code and the assets, but that's that only gives you two to four gigabyte <clears throat> memory because of the 32-bit um, address memory allocation issue that um, Wasm has uh, for now. So we have a, an opportunity, but also uh, more challenges because if we go if we if you can make your design go from two gigabyte limit to 16 gigabyte, then you will face all the performance issues, right? And then of course, um, making it super easy to contribute um, for both uh, content and plugins, etc. So this is these are the big things. Again, I'll, I can share this PDF and you can go through that. But it's something that you can infer from looking at the roadmap. Now, going to the um, hidden agenda, if you look at the breakout of our demographics, <clears throat> you will see that we have as many designers and developers actively using Penpot. And then you can see product managers and founders, which is fine because the decision makers are always fine to have in the mix. Um, we don't expect this to uh, remain one-to-one -one ratio between designers and developers for a uh, long time. I think at some point that one to 10, one designer per 10 developers in the world <clears throat> will, will kick in. At some point, you know, one to five, we will see here. But this is a nice way to express um, what we are after here what we are really after here. So very briefly, because this is a, is, a, is a bit of a complex slide that I put together, but we feel that there is a problem with design at scale. Uh, we don't think design has been benefiting from scaling up as other engineering practices. Um, unfortunately, tools are, are addressing this um, rather on the superpowers to the individual uh, mode which uh, eventually commoditize either code or design. We don't think that is um, the proper way to, to scale up design. But also then tools that are for teams are not addressing cross-functional teams workflows. So I think we, we, we see this as an issue, like they are not addressing the widening gap between how much design can scale up versus how much infrastructure and engineering is already scaling up. Like that, that gap is just <clears throat> widening <clears throat> super fast. But that's, it is an ongoing uh, debate uh, in terms of both types of tools, you know, for the individuals, that's the commoditizing path versus the team uh, tools, not the commoditizing path, but then what's about the workflow. So the future of design for us, in a way you could say, okay, the future of design is to finally get rid of that structural handoff bottleneck between design and code and to have that as a bi-directional uh, relationship. So it is as important to get design to code instantly as well as to have code to design instantly you know why not have this bi-directional flux um, and let's not have lost in translation issues and also let's not have this back and forth um, issue with the fear of losing control whether it's for the designer or the developer but really for us it's, it's all about giving more power to design and designers for us the feature of design cannot be conceived without giving more power to design. And more power to design means giving more power to designers, not more risk of uh, commoditizing. We see trends, uh, continuously trends are saying, okay, we'll just override this <clears throat> and uh, just keep commoditizing design to make sure that we can then um, correlate the scaling up in engineering and code with the scaling up in design. And the sacrifice here is that is design. You know, design will have to be lowered down. We strongly believe that in a zero sum game, like theoretically zero sum, zero sum game, we we need to have developers just give away part of the power that historically they have amassed. Uh, and the ideal way to do that is for them to be happy uh, about giving away that. And this has to happen everywhere in the world. So we need to go every continent every team, every type of organization, and making sure that there's this new culture of sharing that power struggle, you know, a different power struggle. <clears throat> we call this the hidden agenda 
um, and, and we're making it this public, you know, at the beginning of the year, last year, because we want to make sure that people understand how we are positioning ourselves. Whatever we, whatever we build for Pempot, wherever we'll say with like integrating, uh, in integrating with Taiga uh, about, you know, scope definition and design, uh, finally meeting together, whatever we decide in terms of collaboration or open standards or AI or whatever, will have to uh, to answer a very direct question who is really benefiting from this and if the answer does not include in some way designers or design itself the the, the activity then we will say okay let's find a, a different way so that uh, designers stay on top like they lead the conversation and everyone enjoys that new status quo but it's is really designers that um, are leading uh, the way taking everything they need to scale up their designs without any compromise or any um, sacrifice that they have to do. And, you know, so many sacrifices already put in place. We have to put, you know, some, somehow the feature does not, we don't, we don't like the feature where that continues to be a thing. And uh, I think that's, that's it. All right. So we have two questions so far. The first one is, I remember there was some integration with Taiga and Penpot. How tight is that integration now? There's no such thing as a, as an integration. Uh, we plan to have uh, we have plans or an integration um, the team management, so that whatever you invite a new member of a team on Tiger, you will have that on Pempot. But then we are thinking of common sync, user story definition uh, being now a more, much more visual. Like a, a user story on Tiger could just be a Pempot prototype, allowing designers to have more say into how scope is defined. But um i'm sorry if at some point someone thought that there was already some integration not at all we are redeveloping taiga so that we can do that and that will happen you know you you will see that uh tangibly at uh, some point this year so it's very exciting for us because we are doing two things at a time we are actually going at the vanguard we are going further into the lean process we think it's a bit of innovation stagnation in the in the lean agile world for the past decade we are trying to push that you know, to move the needle and at the same time um, merge the lean process and the design process in a way that designers uh, really truly enjoy. But it's not something you can try it now. It's in the works. Okay, great. And then the next question is, is Penpot fully on browser regarding uploaded assets and works made with it? So I think it's a question of what's stored in the browser versus what's local on the user's machine. Yeah, no, everything um, lives in, in, in the browser and uh, you upload things to the browser and the browser stores whatever um, it needs to the server. And so there's a persistence layer that you can you, you come back. So <clears throat> regardless of the, the browser you're using or the as long as you uh, log in with your account, you just retrieve everything. It is true that we are we're using um, Clojure and Clojure scripts. Some some part of the runtime can go to the browser or the server uh, independently. But in terms of the data, um, they start living in, in, in on a browser level. But then at some point, uh, we we just move it to the to the server. Um, there are some, of course, you can self-host your server, and um, so you can have your own penpod instance. And there's some uh, community contributions that get Pempot as a desktop app. They just like encapsulate that in a desktop. You can install that on Fedora or Ubuntu or Windows or Mac and have a desktop experience. That's fine for some use cases too, although it you lack then the real-time collaboration aspect because it's like your desktop, it's just for you. That way you would have both the browser experience but with the local storage, I guess. Okay, great. And see, we have two more. So the next one is, is there some visualization of changes made to the draft over time in Penpot? No, yet, but that's a, a great uh, concept that we're working on, like how to visually have the diff. And I think we are, we have an opportunity here since we have the, uh, the code equals design, we should be able at some point to interpret through the code that has changed what that means in terms of design. Because I think uh, that <coughs> we don't think that designers are going to be very happy just pushing changes in, a, in that design and then knowing that that is goes into a Git repository. You know, that is fine. But it's even better if you already know the changes visually, like what they represent before 
push into the repository. Um, so not blindly just pushing. I mean, you, you, what you see is what you get, so you can push it, but it's better if you already know what's it uh, in changes. Uh, we have the, since we go open standard, we have that opportunity, but in terms of priority, uh, it was not a top priority before GA, uh, but it will it will become um, a top priority after GA. And we have another That's question, I guess. Fantastic. Yes, one more. Um, is there a browser where Penpot runs its best? Yeah, that's a frequently asked question. <laughs> so no wonder it came up. Um, yeah, uh, it works best on uh, Chromium Chrome. Um, the team is working, uh, you know, round the clock to make uh, that um, equally um, snappy on Firefox. Uh, but you can go to the to the frequently asked question, and you will see like the different browsers and the different um, experience that you can get. For now, the suggested one is um, is Chromium Chrome, uh, and then I think the next one is uh, I think is Firefox. But it works great regardless of the browser. But if you want that extra snappy experience, I think for now um, we get that from from Chrome. At some point, to be honest, we will need to have active conversations with different browsers. I mean, we rely so much on browsers, so much that we need them to work in our favor. Uh, otherwise, it, it, the experience will, will not be um, as great, you know, depending on the browser. So we have plans to to engage with uh, Mozilla to try and make sure that, I mean, please, you know, for an open source, open standards uh, platform, we should uh, have like the best, best of experience uh, on Mozilla. That would be so great for the team. But uh, for now, like for free, we get um, better performance on Chrome. That's great. And I think there's no further questions, although there are some comments that works nicely in Firefox in the chat. So there you go. Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's a given. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, will, it was a pleasure and an honor to be here and uh, looking forward really to both FOSDEM uh, in three weeks. The whole team will be there. And second, uh, our GA, January the 31st. Um, so, yeah, that's going to, it's going to be big for us. Uh, great year ahead. Looking forward to it. And thank you, everyone, for attending this this talk. Thank you, Pablo. We actually have a couple of our organizers giving a presentation at FOSDEM. So maybe yeah. you'll have a chance to meet them in person. That was a great talk. Uh, the Fedora design team uses PenPot. We know, um, we know. We're super regu great. <laughs> Regularly. <laughs> super so fan. yes. Thank you so much for, for being here. I think I'm just going to make a few comments since we're closing out the end of the day. Um, but thanks again for being with us. And even Thank with you. jet lag. Oh, yeah. No, it felt it felt OK. And I got this. I think it was really meant for a, a different person here at the co-working space. <laughs> but it's fine. It's a green tea. I'm you know, not complaining. But yeah, it no, was this was fun. No, no, yeah, a gift from the organization. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel uh, jet, so much jet lag as I thought. So okay, so I'll, I'll just disconnect and 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 keep yes. uh, watching the the final remarks. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Bye.